Cool. cool. All right. So we've been on a bit of a steady march towards more abstract things, and I really feel like this fits the theme and that we're going to cap things off with probably one of the most abstract talks of the day. Uh, we are going to see very minimal Swift code during this presentation. It's really going to be an introduction to type systems. And I want to emphasize, there is a way to teach type systems in an incredibly rigorous mathematical way. We are not going to be doing that. We are going to be learning about them through one of the most horrible, inefficient languages in the world, English. <laughs> so, if I, at any point, uh, I'm going to be using some jargon. Like, there is no way to escape that kind of thing. But I want to emphasize that I am really making a conscious effort not to confuse you. And if at any point that you, you feel like um, I haven't defined my terms well enough, or perhaps that I'm using some advanced concepts, uh, please hold your questions to the end, because I think I usually try to answer a lot of things when we go through the presentation. Anyways, let's get started. So we're here at a conference about functional programming and about Swift. And when we're interested in something that lies in the intersection of those, the thing that we are naturally gravitated to is types. Because types are the way that we color our code. It's the way that we think about the world, and it allows us to guarantee some measure of correctness when it comes to our programs. It may not be perfect, but it is something, especially in Swift. So you can see we have some examples here. I'm going to be using this notation, this just simple colon notation, to mean has type. So exactly like it means in Swift. So we have strings, integer literals, Boolean literals, closures. OK. But that's when things work. When things don't quite work, we get interesting error messages. Uh, cannot invoke foo with an argument list of type string. I expected an argument list of type string. Not great. Or this famous one. Expression was too complex to be solved in a reasonable amount of time. Consider breaking up into distinct sub-expressions. I'm sure you've all seen this at some point. So we need to sort of think about why this happens. We need to think about you know, the, the algorithms underlying this kind of thing. Really, what we need to do is put types in context. So that's what we're going to try to do today. We are going to take this simple expression, and I'm going to explain every last piece of jargon on this slide in English. But first, we need to talk about cubes. In fact, we're going to talk about the lambda cube. Because we need a way to express a common vocabulary when we talk about programming languages and the power that their type systems contain. Again, this is another one of those slides where I do not expect you to understand the notation here. So, Really, the lambda cube is a way of classifying the power of programming languages in this nice directed form. You'll notice all of these arrows go one direction. And in fact, that direction indicates the feature that you need to add to your type system in order to get to the next level. So you can't, for example, jump from the lambda calculus down in that uh, bottom left corner up to the calculus of inductive constructions up in the right, which is the thing that powers cock. You have to implement first and follow these arrows wherever they may lead. And the thing I love about this cube is that it tells you so much more than just simply, you know, the features you need to add. It actually, if you interpret it different ways, can tell you different things. So for example, we can sort of imagine pushing into the slide. And if you push into that slide, the face that you get are all the programming languages that, are, that have some notion of type operators, which is something that Swift doesn't have and I'm not going to cover. If you push up the top faces, all the ones that cover higher, uh, higher order functions and polymorphism. And if you push to the right, all of these are dependently typed, uh, sorry, systems for dependently typed programming languages. The natural question is, where does Swift live on this cube? I'm being generous here. Swift lives there, which is, if you look at it, we have polymorphism. We sort of have type operators in constructors. but we can't talk about generalizing over them the way that we should. So really, Swift is sort of lying in the middle of the face instead. But you notice we're not that advanced, right? We're not up in the top right corner. We're, we're not even all the way over to lambda omega over there. We have 
you know, we have nice features in our type system, but we're not state-of-the-art, shall we say. So one way to learn about where we are, to put this thing into context, is to visit this URL and to read the documentation, specifically the documentation called typechecker.rst. So that is a file which was written by Doug Greger and Jordan Rose and I think little bits of John McCall. I don't see the audience right now. Anyways, and you'll notice that it includes a lot of jargon, and I've highlighted some of it here. So object-oriented programming, operator overloading, subtyping, constrained, parametric polymorphism. You'll also notice terms like Hindley-Milner and uh, perhaps uh, subtyping, all kinds of stuff. These are big words, and there's not really a lot of explanation of what they mean in that document, because it sort of assumes that you have a background in type systems, which is very hard to get. So instead, we're going to try and use our place on this Lambda cube, and we're sort of going to explore a simpler version of Swift, a simpler version that we can reason about using all of that crazy complex jargon we hid in the first part. So all of this setup is really just to say, I am going to reduce what you think Swift is to three concepts. You are only allowed to use closures, variables, specifically let bindings, and applications to closures. You can't have functions, you can't have structs, you can't have um, enums, all that stuff. We're going to throw that aside and think of a simpler, more reasonable system so that we don't complicate our, our understanding here. And this makes type checking easy. This reduction makes type checking easy because we're allowed to use the bare minimum rules. We don't have to go all out. So without further ado, let's learn some notation. So this line is fundamental. You'll notice all the rules look like that, right? Something on the top, something on the bottom. So these are called sequence. And a sequence is something that you're all familiar with. It's an if statement. It's a premise followed by a conclusion. The way that you read these rules is, if the top is true, then the bottom is true. Easy, right? All right, let's keep going. So we want some obvious rules, right? If I take a look at an integer literal, I can say it has type int. I don't need any other extra, uh, extra information. Similarly, I can do that with Boolean literals. I can just look at them. And I can do that with empty tuple literals. I can just look at them and know that they have type void. And the way that we encapsulate this in the theory is with this no premises and then this funny gamma turnstile empty thing, one, whatever. So you can think of gamma as your general knowledge when you're solving this problem. It's sort of this background that you have, like all the variables that you've encountered while solving the system, all the functions you know about, all the structs, all the data types. Gamma is a dictionary. It's a big dictionary filled with names and types. So what this says is that gamma says that some, this is our generic stand-in for literals. There are actually three rules here. And you need one for integers, one for Boolean, one for tuples. But I've decided to condense them down into this rule following this sort of Wadlerian notation. And ignore the arrow for now. We'll get to that later. Let's do a more complicated rule. If I know that x has type A, and if type inference says that y has type B, if I make a closure, that's what this lambda notation says, if I make a closure taking an x and returning a y, that must have type A to B. There is no other type it can have. And this is what that looks like when you jargonify it. This says gamma contains some binding for x with some type A. And using that binding, we can know that y has type B. And the interesting part is y can be any general expression. So for example, I can apply a function and use x as an argument. I can use x in the definition. You know? Or I could just as easily just return x, and then I know that a and b are equal, and then I have a function from a to a. So this rule actually tells you a lot of information in a very small amount of space. And that's why we use all of these crazy sequences, because we can pack all this information into such a small space. And you'll see that later. This is the most abstract rule, because I have to talk about type variables, and I'm not going to talk about type variables. So suffice to say, this gives us a general condition about when we can say a function is actually polymorphic. Because we can't, when we're solving these systems, we're going to have a bunch of type variables all over the place. And we're going to be tempted to say, well, this function is generic. I don't need to solve these 
at all, because it's just generic. And this gives us a rule that says you can't do that in certain cases. In fact, you can't do that when alpha is a free type variable, which is, again, something we're not going to get into because I'm not going to talk about that kind of polymorphism too much. And this is what that looks like when you use the, when you use the standard notation. So let's use another rule here. If type inference says E is type A, if A is a subtype of B, then E is free to have type B. This is intuitive to you, right? This is Liskov substitution principle, which is a thing that you learn in object-oriented programming 101. This says, if I have a very specific thing, I can upcast to the general thing and keep using it. You know, I can replace general things by specific things. That's all encoded in this rule. And it looks like this. And specifically, you'll notice that I'm not using the standard operator for expressing subtype, you'll notice it's a less than or equal to symbol. It's not a caret and then a uh, colon, like it usually is, because this system doesn't talk about subtyping. This system talks about specificity. It talks about specialization. But that's not something we, again, it's not something that we tend to need to know about. And if it helps you to think about it as subtyping, please do it, because that's the only way that these rules are going to get through. So let's try to make a rule ourselves. If I want to type check an if statement, I need three things, right? I need a condition, and I need an if statement, and an else statement. So we're going to call those C, E1, and E2. Now we think, what do we need out of C, E1, and E2? Well, we need C to have a type, and we need E1 and E2 to have the same type. We, we don't want to be able to return a string out of one out of the if, and then an, an integer out of the else. We want it to be the same type. And so we're going to spawn Two types, because we can do that. So one of them is bool, we know that. The other one, we're just going to call tau. We could easily call it A, B, T, it doesn't matter. It's just a name. And this is, quite literally, the rule. If type inference says, C has type bool, E1 and E2 have type tau, then I can check the type of if statements. It's intuitive, right? You need all of this information in order to be able to proceed. If you're missing any one of these parts, it's a type error. And this is literally the rule that is usually written down in most papers. It's a, so you can sort of see how we go about deriving these for, for actual programming languages. You know, like Swift contains a lot of control flow structures. Each one of those needs one of these rules. And we usually omit them because, remember, we're only talking about a simplified subset of Swift. We only have closures, let bindings, and applications. We don't have if statements. But this is sort of gives you a feel for how these rules are formed in the first place. There's no extra fluff. So here's the rules that we just covered. You can see from the top, we have, I can check literals. We have on the left, a certain condition about when I can declare things as polymorphic. We have on the right, a condition about how to type closures. And on the bottom, we have a specialization rule, a subtyping rule. And you might think, OK, I have a lot of rules. I have a lot of jargon. What can I do with this, right? Well, this is math. Things compose. And in fact, things compose in very natural ways. We can stack these rules on top of each other. We can derive from top to bottom just by introducing new premises. So for example, we can check the way that information sort of flows through this is you look at the conclusion that you have on the very, very bottom, which is that if I apply v to the closure taking x and returning e, well, what I need to do that, if I look one line up, is I need uh, the closure to be well-defined, and I need the variable to have type C. Well, the closure has type A to B, so I need my subtyping rule, right? So I need to work one step up in my closure definition. And then, finally, I need to know that A and B are types in general, and that X is type A, and that B has type, has type B. You can see if we're missing any one of these parts, again, it's a type error. And in fact, this is the chain of reasoning that we use. And you will never see this notation again because this is dense and unreadable. And I'm so sorry for introducing it to you. <laughs> so you'll notice during the explanations, I make, a very, uh, I make a very fine point out of saying the word type inference and type checking. There is a difference. In fact, if you look at the rule set that we have defined here, this is where those arrows start to come in. I'm going to color all of the arrows that correspond to type checking green. And I'm going to co color all the arrows that correspond to type inference blue. 
And you notice that we don't have any rules that conclude in type inference. We have only rules that conclude in type checking. So this is the unfortunate part. We have five rules that terminate in inference. But here's the wonderful part. They are all mostly just turned around versions of the original checking rules. So we're going to go through them uh, a little bit quicker than before. And we're also going to start with the notation and work our way out towards English. So this looks like that first rule I showed you for literals, right? It's just the arrow was green. So now this says, I can infer that literals have a particular type. And in fact, that's what we expect, right? I can infer the type of empty tuple literals just by looking at them. I can infer the type of integers just by looking at an integer literal. I can infer the type of a Boolean literal just by looking at a Boolean. This next rule is fairly obvious. But it doesn't look like that from the notation. So let's turn it into English. If we've already seen that a variable x has type a at some point in time, we've stored that in our context, then x has type a. x cannot change types on us. There's no way for that to happen. And so the inference rule for variables is literally, have I seen this before? That easy. This next one says, if a is a type and e has type a, because it's now possible for things not to be types, that's wonderful. Um, Gamma says that, e has, that if I encounter an annotation that the user wrote that says that E is type A, then I can infer that that expression is correct. And so what this rule lets you do is say, if at any point when you're writing your Swift program and you annotate something with a particular type and you're wrong, this says the type checker is allowed to check your work. And so what the type checker is supposed to do and what it does in Haskell is it will literally throw away your annotation. User annotations in Haskell especially, they make a difference in Swift. But in Haskell, they mean nothing. Haskell will infer the body of your program as though the annotations never existed, and then it will check your annotations. So that's what this rule says we can do. Next, we have a rule for function application. And it's, again, the jargon obscures the English. And so we're going to use the English. If I can infer that f is a function from a to b, sigma to tau, whatever, and E is a good argument. E is our sigma. E is, you know, I have a function from bool to bool. E is bool. I can infer the result of calling F with E. I can apply the argument to the function. And we need this rule because you can sort of do nonsensical things. Like say, I have a function from int to string. And I feed it a string. Oh, that's not going to work. Because it's not a good argument. Because it doesn't have the right type. And I think we're getting towards the end of the rule. So this says if sigma to tau is a function type, again, a to b, bool to bool, whatever you want to think of it as, and x is type as the type of the first thing, and we can infer, given that x is that type, because we've seen x before, that e has the type of the result. If I form a closure that takes an x and returns an e, then I can infer that that closure has type sigma to tau, or a to b, or bool to bool, whatever you want to think about this. Really, these are just names. These are just names for types. You can instantiate them at whatever you want. And now you can really see the value of this notation. We went from something that took two lines to describe to something that takes an entire paragraph to describe. So this is why papers written about this will use that dense notation. Because you can pack all of that information up into these single line rules that you can just write down in a, in a box and call it figure seven. So these are all the rules for how to type check our subset of Swift. Remember, there's only three concepts that we're really focused on here. And we see that we have nine rules. It's, it's bad. It's, it's manageable, but it's bad. But really, we need to sort of you know, turn this talk around. We need, we need to discuss the nitty gritty of these kinds of things. So I'm finally going to grant you a break, and we are going to infer an expression together in Swift using our rules. So the way that we would think about this intuitively is we need to break this down into its component sub-expressions because we can't just type check the whole thing. None of our rules say I can type check a function applied to another function which has function applications inside of it. We can only talk about atomic components. So we need to get down to the level of atomic components. me. 
Anyways, so we're first gonna break the pluses, then we're gonna break the divisions. And now, what's the rule that you intuitively think of here? Remember, I can look at literals and know their types. So that's the rule we're gonna use. All of these have type in, and that's the rule that justifies it. Next, we're gonna roll everything back up, because we know all the types. So now we're gonna focus on each one of these individual applications of the division operator. So we know that the arguments have type int, and we know that there's a division operator in the standard library that goes from int to int to int. What type does it have to have? Well, if we apply the arguments to the function, it has to have type int. And this matches your intuition, no? Now we're gonna roll up one more step, back to the original expression. Now that we know what types each one of these arms has, we can think about the type of the overall expression. And in fact, it's the type you would expect, type int. So we went from an expression where we knew none of the types to an expression where we know all of the types using this very systematic way of breaking things down and rolling them back up. And that's the way a general type inference algorithm tends to work. You usually sort of break down into the sub into the, each sub-expression and work your way down into the leaves. And then you solve your way from bottom to top. And if at any point you wind up with a problem, you report that as an error. Let's try a more complex example. You'll notice that this function is kind of wonky, especially because you probably could just ditch the closure altogether and probably could ditch the function and just use plus. But we're going to do this specifically because I want to show you what happens when you infer around a closure. So we're going to focus on that sub-expression right there, and we're going to give ourselves a little bit of space. I'm going to make it explicit about what gamma does here, because before we didn't have to involve any variables, but now you see we have two arguments coming into the function. So we're going to take x and y, and we're going to remember them. We're going to do one more thing. We're going to remember foo. We're going to remember that foo has type array of t to array of t to array of t. Why do we need this? We need this because I can call foo in the body of foo. I can recur infinitely in the body of foo. I need to know that type. But we're not doing that right now, so we'll just, we'll just have it. So let's go one by one again. We know the type of x. We put it in our, in our gamma space. We know the type of y, too. We put it in our gamma space. We, we remember this. So we can add these type annotations, but we're sort of stuck on that, on that implicit argument, right? We don't know what type it has, so let's just use this blue question mark. Let's stick it into sort of this fake type signature too, like we'll get around to it later. And you'll notice that we have two kinds of blue question mark. We have the one on the right and we have the one in the argument there. And they're a different color because they're different variables, but you notice that implicit <coughs> argument there has that same type. So if we can solve the light blue one on the top or the bottom, we can solve the other one, but we can't solve the dark blue one. All right, so we can't, we don't know this type, but we can you if we zoom out into the overall closure expression, we can apply this rule which talks about applying functions to their arguments. And we can fill in this type because we know what type y has and we know that y is being applied to this expression, so what type does the closure have to take? It has to take whatever the type of y is and y, we know y's type because we remembered it earlier. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna solve for our light blue type variable. And finally, because we now know the type of the inner expression, we can just do it. We know that when you add two arrays of t's together, you're going to get an array of t back. And so that's the return type of this expression. And so again, we've gone from a situation where we only have annotations for those two type variables to a situation where we can infer the type of this entire thing by breaking them down into sub-expressions and reasoning about them at that level. Type checking is easy in Swift. Type inference, hard in Swift. Now, what do I mean by this? Let's pull some jargon out of typechecker.rst, specifically the features that Swift's type system claims to have. And we're going to start with our basic system here, and we're going to sort of do an algorithms 101 sort of top-level view of the cost of type inference. So the algorithm that we use is called algorithm W. It actually has a very good runtime. It's just about linear. It's not linear, but it's just about linear. 
in the size of the expression you feed it. It also takes polynomial space. So if you don't remember your algorithmics, polynomial is pretty good. Not great, pretty good. Let's see what happens when we add features. If we add subtyping, we are now p-space hard, but we're still polymorphic. So this means that we're as hard as the hardest p-space functions. So we can't do any better than p-space. We move up to exceptions. We still poly, well, it still takes polynomial time, but now we're p-space complete. We are harder than some of the hardest p-space computations. Let's add parametric polymorphism. Ooh. This is deterministic exponential time. So now you have an exponent raised to a power. That's pretty bad. But we're still p-space uh, complete, which is something. OK, let's add function overloading. Oh, Ooh, now we're undecidable. Bad. OK, so I want to present a short proof of this fact, but I'm not going to do that here. There's a gist uh, up on the uh, gist page associated with my uh, GitHub username, which you'll see at the end. Uh, it's called 3sat.swift. It uses the overloading mechanism in Swift to solve 3sat, which is a famously NP-hard problem. Let's go one further. We need constrained parametric polymorphism, right? Well, that brings us from undecidable to non-deterministic exponential time. Not deterministic exponential time. If we had a Turing machine that was capable of running every possible path all at once and then giving us the right answer, it still takes exponential time. That's how bad this problem is. Plus, let's see what happens when we apply this feature set that we're adding to our list of rules, because these rules have to grow with that feature set. OK, so we need to talk about protocol conformances. So we're going to add this environment theta. We need to talk about structs and classes. So we need to add a formation rule, and we need to add a projection rule. We need to talk about constrained polymorphism. So we need to talk about pi of a, which is a set of constraints. We need to talk about protocol conformances. They're up there. This is ridiculous. And this is missing 30 to 60 rules. <laughs> Hyperinference in Swift is hard. It's hard because there are 30 to 60 rules governing how you're supposed to solve this entire language. And I want to emphasize that analysis that I did before is entirely ad hoc. Some graduate student or other needs to actually figure out how hard it is to infer things in Swift. Uh, that was sort of pieced together from, from various papers about each one of these individual features put together. I'm sure there's a nicer way you can, you can reason about these kinds of things. So if we just write down all these rules together in one gigantic function, you know, we can probably reasonably go about applying our method before where we sort of break things down and then we roll back up and we, we add types of things. It doesn't work in general is the problem. You know, you're going to reach a point where you have to apply a subtyping constraint. You're going to reach a point where, you know, this value is supposed to have this, this type and it's convertible through strings, but then you have a string on the right, so you need a conversion constraint. And then you're going to have a certain point where you need something to conform to a protocol, but it only conforms to a protocol when the, when the generic thing underlying it has a particular concrete type. It's, it's a mess. We need a way to reason about a mess. And luckily, there's another part of mathematics that we can uh, bring into our problem set here, and I am not going to drag you through the same explanation of this part of math as I did through the type, uh, type theory one, and it's graph theory. We're specifically going to represent our problem set as a set of constraints. We're going to build a graph, and then I'm going to show you how we solve that graph. And this is literally the way that the Swift type checker works. This uh, was actually gathered from output that you can get from the Swift compiler. If you pass dash x front end dash debug dash constraints, you will see a nice pretty output with some crazy graph theory jargon on it. So this is our original expression, our, our let binding expression. And I introduced this one because it actually allows me to show you a number of interesting optimizations that we perform when we compute this graph. So instead of you know, disassembling the expression and going back again. We're going to assign each region where we need to type a number. These are technically type variables, but for now, think of them as numbers. So you may notice we have one number covering, you know, all the literals. We have one number covering all of the pluses. We got one on the let. We got one on the binding on the right-hand side. We have 2, 6, and 11 kind of hanging out. They seem superfluous, right? 
And then we have 5, 9, and 14 hanging out. And we have 10 that's completely outside of here. So this is my janky notation for this. Um, 5, 9, and 14 correspond to the uh, divisions that are going on inside. I just didn't want to put things on top of each other. 10 exists because, if you didn't know this, uh, addition in Swift is left associative. So what we actually have is a set of parens around the first two terms. So we need 10 to represent that whole paren expression. And then 2, 6, and 11 are disjunction constraints because we have 60 overloads of slash. We need to work through all of them. So we're going to have type variables that represent when I hit this point, I'm going to go 60 different ways and find the right one. We're going to arrange all of these in all of their glory, but we're, when we generated them, we remembered some things about them. Specifically, we remembered which ones were literals. We remembered which ones were function applications. We remembered which one of these corresponded to, say, the let binding. You know, we have all that information. We've just distilled it down into this numeric view. And now we're going to assign meaning to things by talking about their relationships to each other. So we're going to generate the first of those relationships right now. And this is using a pass in the type checker, which I believe my former boss called um, linked expression analysis. So if you notice, if you think back to the original expression, we had a bunch of literals and a bunch of arithmetic. We know the type of literals. We have a simple rule for how to get the type of literals. So what we'll do is we'll walk down the expression, and every time that we see a type variable that references a literal, we're going to say they're equal to each other. And so that's what these bidirectional arrows say, is that if I solve any one of these connected components, I can solve the whole thing. So that automatically reduces our problem space, because you can see we've gotten rid of six, six variables. We still have 11 to go. Next, we're going to compute connected components. So this phase looks through the relationships that we defined before, because remember, we know what each one of these type variables represents. We know whether it represents a function application, or an argument to a function, or an input or an output. Remember all of that. And we reduce that let expression to this. This doesn't look like a let expression at all. But the interesting part about it is, when I show you the solver, you can sort of see the structure. So we're going to start solving this. We're going to guess. That's how bad it is. We're going to guess what type 1 has. We're going to guess it has type int. And the reason we're going to guess that is because the actual type of, uh, of addition by default is expressible by integer literal convertible, I believe. Right? And that has a default constraint of int. So we're going to check int first. So we're going to assign 1 int. Well, you notice it's connected to things, right? We can keep solving for each one of those connected components. So let's do so. Because we know that it has type int. Uh, oh, wait, one is a function. I'm sorry. <laughs> one is a function from int to int, int. And it has arguments 9 and 5. And it has output 10. That's what this notation means. Now I remember. <laughs> one, is, one is a function. One is specifically, I think, the uh, addition. I can check that. One is, yep, it's that, uh, you can't see that at all. One is that addition right there. And we're going to guess that it has type int, int, int. Go through this again, and we're solving. We know what type it has, because we're going to guess. Now, because we know it has type int, 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 we know its arguments have to have type int, respectively. Solved. Nothing else to do. We know it has output type int, we can solve for number 10. Good. Let's go one step further. 14 is the second uh, addition, and we know that 10 is its input. So we solve 10, we're done. We know that the other side of 14, we can reasonably guess that 14 has type int, 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 because it's a homogeneous uh, integer expression there. We know that 0 also has to have type int, and we know that the output of, the, of 14 is 15, and we can solve for that, so we do. All that's left is 16, and 16 is the entire let expression. We're done. 15 and 16 are connected. So types flow through the graph. If you take nothing else away from that, take away the types flow through this graph. And that's what makes this problem easier to solve, is because we can reason about connected components much easier than we can reason about a huge decomposition of a huge expression. But what about these type variables on the top? And what about the disjunction constraints in the bottom? Well, you know, we guessed. 
these disjunction constraints. We've solved them. They're done. So we're going to focus on the type variables in the top. And specifically, these correspond to all the integer literals in that expression. So we can solve three. And when we solve three, we can solve all of them simultaneously because they're all connected to each other. We know every, every one of those up there in purple has type int. And we can just discharge those discussion constraints. They disappear. So we've solved this entire graph in a different way. We've taken a look at a way that we can use a what seems like a completely different part of mathematics from type theory to attack a very hard problem. And what I want you to take away from this is that type inference is hard, but it doesn't have to be. The reason we have this crazy graph nonsense stuck up in the type checker is because Swift has so many features. We can't keep track of them in that nice, simple nine rule system that we had before. We have to use the 30 to 60 rule system. And so the way that we do this is we break these, the rules down into a general set of constraints. We have a thing that you, you can grep the Swift source. It's called constraint kind. You can see all the different constraints we define in our constraint graph. We have fascinating algorithms to try and make this go faster. And I wish I could explain them all to you, but I don't understand a lot of them. <laughs> so I would be remiss if I didn't offer you a little bit of homework if you wanted it. If you visit this URL, you are going to find an implementation of three algorithms, algorithm W, algorithm M, and a little constraint generator. Algorithm W and algorithm M will solve the problem for you automatically. The constraint generator is missing its solver. If you feel like it, finish that solver and check your answers against algorithm W and algorithm M. And with that, I'm done. All right, so there's a boatload of questions. <laughs> Anything at all? Any jargon that you need explained? Any little thing that you didn't quite understand? If you need me to go back in the slides, I know this is a lot of information. Sure. Um, how did you get started in tech? Um, that came because Twitter, I think. It was a long time ago. Uh, follow John Sterling. I think, he was my, I think he was my introduction to this. If you can, he might have locked his Twitter account. Uh, I have a question about something that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Have gone wrong? Error on the wrong line. Yes. In case that is, so how would you debug this? For example, if you have something that operator error or something else uh, has the wrong type, and then it carries that assumption forward, mm -hmm. and then later effectively it's function overloading. That type to resolve the function, mm -hmm. something doesn't work, get an error message pretty far from where the actual mistake is. Yep. In that case, how can we help debug this or like what are, you know, is there any way to that as part of this can help prevent that kind of situation? So the reason that happens is because Swift actually ignores, let me find the rule. Swift ignores. The, I can check your work rule. There it is. Swift ignores this rule. It believes that you are omnipotent, that you know your types better than the type system does. And so it generates what's called a um, contextual type when you annotate things. And then that contextual type is sort of assumed to be correct, and it anchors the solver. And so when you're, like you mentioned, if you annotate something incorrectly, we sort of roll with it. And then we assume that we're wrong. And then we usually assume that we're wrong way downstream from where the actual error was. So the way that you can sort of help with that, you're not going to get perfect diagnostics, but you are going to get better diagnostics if you break the argument that you're applying to that function out into a let binding. Because then we can let Swift solve that type for itself. And that let bindings type can then infer more down the line. And we'll try to, I mean, it's not perfect, but we will try to diagnose further up the chain. And I do this constantly because I'm dealing with a lot of generic functions in, in a lot of ways, right? Hmm? Um, I don't want to go again. So, well, uh, you know, is, is the reason why uh, sometimes Tyler runs really slowly when you uh, was, or, or the reason to make it faster is that you find some of the variable, is that because we're, we're coloring the graph? Like, we're, we're have a connected component and we're making 
Did I go too fast? Okay, so the problem, right? Uh, if you have uh, a huge expression, uh, literals and dictionary literals, mm -hmm. um, the compilation time blows up. Yep. Um, but if you if chunk of that bind it to a let variable with an explicit type, the compilation time goes back down. Yep. Um, Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Is, is the, I guess, is that related to the way that the graph it, it is, uh, because when you're talking about, we have to generate, oh, are we polymorphic in the size? There's some ridiculous uh, constant relative, like a number of type variables that it takes to completely cover an expression. And if you have some crazy thing that involves closures all over the place, and we have to infer arguments, and, and it's not pretty like that, you know, like that's why the error says consider breaking it into distinct sub-expressions, is because we generate an enormous amount of type variables. And we're usually able to compute connected components fairly efficiency, efficiently and solve them sort of independently. And, but you can imagine that's going to slow down if you have a graph of 1,000 type variables versus a graph of 10. Like 17 type variables ain't that bad compared to most of the expressions in Swift. Sure. Absolutely. So, talk about the trade-offs. So the graph theoretical representation is really just a more efficient way to describe the problem space. It really doesn't have much to do with solving like, the problem in general. You can take many different approaches. Like this graph theoretic approach that we're taking is incredibly advanced. Like I, I don't know of any other programming language that takes that much time to reason about these fairly advanced concepts in, in constraint solving. Uh, the second half of your question was? Ah. Um, so the trouble is, again, these are features that you're adding to your, to your core calculus. You know, if Swift were to steal Cox Galena backend or something and lower all of its expressions down from whatever they had to, to, um, to Cox core type theory and then lower that type theory down into Galena or something, like, that's a way to do it. That's certainly a way to do it, but it's, it's hard. Like, you have to translate Swift terms into calculus of inductive construction terms. You have to translate, uh, and you know, like the, a famous encoding in the Effing modules paper is taking system F, which is that lambda omega up in the top there, and, and uh, taking its module definition and lowering that back down into a lesser flavor of, of type theory that's easier to reason about. Yeah. Which, yeah. Like, it, it seems to me it's easier when you start higher up and need to lower, like, you need to express the lower things and the higher things exactly like you said. That's fairly easy because you can just encode them. But when you need to start from something lower and move to something higher, you have to take on some... I, I, I guess I'm asking about, I don't have to all four times. I kind of ask myself that question too because it is it is the easier way to do this. Yeah. Haskell lowers itself to core, as you're as you're probably well aware, and core is uh, explicitly typed system F plus constructors, right? Yeah, sounds right. Um, I think the reason they did it is because they really weren't focused on on that level of extreme correctness. Like core lowers to code, you know. Instead, we can just sort of take what the user wrote and fairly efficiently translated into SIL, and then lower SIL down to LVMIR and, and emit assembly, that looks roughly like the program that you started with. Haskell exists at this sort of higher level space, Cock and Agda and all those. They exist in a higher level space where you don't care about memory representations and, and layouts and all this stuff. But that is a way. Um, yeah, you, you definitely can speak more to this than I can. 
Um, so the, uh, I would say that like, the Lambda Q doesn't have in that order. It's strictly, it's strictly more powerful. All the other points. That's an excellent point. Like, even if we encoded ourselves in, in cock or something, we still have to do overload resolution. There's no way around that. Problem's still hard. It's just hard in a different way. One short question. Sure. Uh, anybody? That's more about the guessing. Like, if I add 25 or 50 types, is that going to slow down the like, Do you want to see? <laughs> uh, how do I drag this in? What? <laughs> there we go. And let's get bigger. Uh, does that do anything? Let's, yeah, let's do the constraint. Uh, you wanted to add, like, how many numbers? 25. 25. Okay, let's uh, do a left fold then, I guess. We need is that one. Oh, that's zero. Four. And we need to reduce. Can't type. Reduce with starting at zero with. Oh wait, no. This isn't going to show you anything. Oh, you actually need to type this. <laughs> <laughs> that should be. Oh God. That should be enough for anybody. that. Oh, wait, these, these are the overloads. This is where we're doing overload resolution. Look at the, all these overloads. Fantastic. <laughs> yep, and then that's the AST down the bottom that we generate. <laughs>